You'll take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 22. Again, we're continuing our study in the parables of Matthew, and we come to the last parable of the kingdoms talking to the religious people. And so we looked last week at the concern that Jesus has as he confronts the religious people. And so today we're going to find ourselves at the parable of the wedding feast. And so one of the things I want you to understand as we come to this passage is one, it's the king who's making all their arrangements. Now that's a little different for our society because it's usually you would only have mostly the father only paying the bills, but it's usually the mother and the bride who are planning the wedding ceremony. But here it's the king who's making all the arrangements. And so what he's done is he's also had the hand delivered announcements for coming and honoring the son. And so it wasn't um, just a, uh, a suggestion. I want you to think that what the king is doing when he's giving out these invitations, it's a command come and be a part of the celebration. And so when we see the rejection here, it's Israel's rejection of the mission of being the church and blessing the entire world. So I want you to keep that in mind as we come to this passage this morning. Matthew chapter 22, the first 14 verses. Hear the word of the Lord. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. So again, he sent other servants saying, tell those who were invited, see, I prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off one to his farm and another to his business while the rest seized his servants treated them shamefully and killed them. And the king was angry and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. And he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Again, Father, as we come to your word, Lord, we ask that the Holy Spirit, we know his presence is here. And so, Father, we ask that the Spirit would do his work, Lord, that he would recall to us the truths of your scripture, or that he would encourage, but Lord, may he also cut to the very core of who we are. Lord, for those of us who need to confess, Lord, may we find ourselves in a place where we would confess our sins before you and repent and turn back to you. But Lord, for all of us, may we be encouraged by your word this morning, knowing that we have been invited to the wedding feast of your son, Jesus Christ, and his church, his bride, of which we have been called and are part of. So, Father, teach us this morning. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So we're going to see three very specific things. The first thing we're going to see is the rejected invitation. And now this um, applies to the nation of uh, the Jews, the Israel. And so we find ourselves seeing the couple of things that happen. But we also want to make sure that we apply it to ourselves. Because it's easy to talk about those people. Look at how they messed up without actually looking and saying, okay, so where do we stand in this passage? And so we're going to see that they did a couple of things. One, there was indifference to the invitation that came. Now, indifference means that we think that it's unimportant. So there are people who believe that the, the imitation that the king had sent out was just unimportant. And so they were rude on a very simple level. But again, they were treasonous because it was a command from their king to come. And yet they decide that 
it's just not enough for them to do. And so J.C. Ryle says this in regards to indifference and neglect. He says, open sin may kill its thousands, but indifference and neglect to the gospel kills their tens of thousands. Now, why is that? Because so many of us are settling for momentary pleasures. See, we're about the self. We're about whatever makes us feel good. And so we find um, lots of people dealing with situations where they just say, okay, God, you can have this part of my life, but not this part. Or God, I'll give you my quiet time, but you don't get the rest of the week. And so what happens is we start to um, put our, our time and our efforts and we put them on things that ultimately don't matter. And a lot of times we find ourselves settling for maybe even better things, but not the best thing. And the best thing is what the king has given to us. And so maybe you're just indifferent to God. You don't hate him, but you're also not in love with him. You're just indifferent to who he is. But there are others in regard to this who start to be giving excuses and the passage that Chris read for us earlier, as well as this passage is people start saying things like, well, I'm just too busy. I've got other important things to do. There's other things on my plate. I, I just can't fit this in. Sometimes we even find that even in the midst of weddings themselves, there's a story about a lady called Ruth Anna Metzger. And Ruth Anna Metzger was a professional singer, and so she got to sing at a very wealthy man's uh, wedding. And so then they're waiting around, and they're getting all these great hors d'oeuvres, and they're waiting to go up to the reception, which was on top of the, um, a, a place in Seattle that was very, uh, very wealthy area, and they were going to go for this great reception. And they brought out a leather-bound book, and they were supposed to start going up the staircase, and Ruth Ann and her husband start going over, and the man asks, well, what are, what are your names? And she gives the name, and he's just like, um, spell that for me, because I'm not finding you in the book. And so she spells the name, and he's just like, I'm sorry, your name is not in the book for the reception. And she's just like, I sang at the wedding. And he's like, I don't care what you did, if your name is not in the book, you don't go to the reception. And so they had to be escorted off into the service elevator and they actually took them all the way down into the floor and it was silence between her and her husband and the, fi the husband finally asked her what happened and she said, when the invitation came, I was so busy, I didn't RSVP. But I just thought because I was there singing in the wedding that they would let me in. See, even in the midst of busyness, sometimes we miss the opportunity. And when the king sent out, again, it's not like our weddings where for us, it's a, a one afternoon or an evening celebration. This was multiple days of a celebration. And so there were definitely times for those who were a part of the family, but there is the bigger extended part of the community. And so there's plenty of time to come and he gave plenty of opportunities. These weren't just, you couldn't say, well, it got lost in the mail. These were hand delivered invitations into the hands of the people. So they had the opportunity to go. They just chose chose not to go for whatever reason. And so there's an indifference to God a lot of times. There's excuses we make for God, but there's also opposition. There is ultimately open defiance. Now, maybe they didn't approve of the marriage. Maybe they didn't like the bride. Maybe they didn't like the king. We don't know. We're not told. But for them, they are no longer going to render allegiance to the king. And so they are giving up a, a denial. And not only are they giving a denial, but they murder the servants that go out with the invitation. They so hate the king. Now, again, most of us would, would kind of shy away and say, well, I would never do that. I would never kill anybody. There's a skit I'm reminded of um, when I was doing youth ministry, and it was by a a man and a woman, they would go around to these youth um, groups and do these skits. And one of them was called Jesus and Me. And it starts off with um, 
the woman and her daily devotions and she was going through one of the, the sections in the Bible that many of us skip of so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so and she ends and she goes, oh, thank you, God, for teaching me from your word today so that I might apply it to my heart and I'm going to pray to you now and oh, yeah, God, take care of these things. God, take care of these things and God, please be with me today. Yeah, that sounds like a good prayer. Yeah, God, be with me and then the next thing that is is the person who's the Jesus figure comes in but the next situation is she gets a phone call. She gets a phone call from a friend talking about a party where there's going to be drinking and there's going to be the good looking guy who's concerned about whether she's going to be there or not. And so she starts making all of these, these scenes of trying to make, oh, there's going to be three kegs of milk. Oh, that sounds great. Three kegs of milk. Oh, and there's going to be so-and-so there. Isn't that great? He is so, so hot. I mean, he's so hot for Jesus. And she starts making all these excuses. And so she starts saying, um, she starts getting ready to leave and Jesus starts walking with her. And she goes, well, wait a minute, Jesus, you, you can't come with me. And she starts getting a little angry and she starts, you know, you're not going to feel comfortable going to this kind of party. And she gets to the place where she says, okay, I've been lying to you. You're not welcome. And she gets to the place where she says, please get away from me, Jesus. And the figure goes into the figure of the cross. See, sometimes we are in direct opposition to God because we don't want him to be a part, definitely not every part of our lives. Jesus, be Lord of this part, but not this part. So maybe we too find ourselves in opposition to the things that God would want for us. And so how does the king respond? The response of the king is that he exerts his authority. And he goes and he says, these people are unworthy servants. Listen to Matthew Henry's quote in regards to the Jewish people. He says, the wedding is ready. The covenant of grace is ready to be sealed. A church is ready to be founded. But they who were bidden, that is the Jews to whom pertained the covenant and the promises by which they were of old invited to the feast of fat things, they were not worthy. They were utterly unworthy and not by their contempt of Christ had they forfeited all the privileges that they were invited to. Note, it's not owing to God that sinners perish, but to themselves. Thus, when Israel of old was within sight of Canaan, the land of promise that was ready, the milk and honey that were ready, but their unbelief and murmuring and their contempt of that pleasant land shut them out and their carcasses were left to perish in the wilderness. And for me, I start asking my question, am I, not, am I that person? If I were given the opportunity to go out and spy the land and to see that it was a, a good place and a place filled with milk and honey and a, fi a place of blessings, would I look at the giants that are there and say, God, you can't do this. See, part of us as a church is we're supposed to be putting ourselves in positions where we look to God to do the miracles where we look to God to provide the blessings, not in our own power. It's too easy to congratulate ourselves, but when God begins to work and begins to move, it's an amazing thing. And so God, as this king, exerts his authority upon these unworthy servants, and he goes to the point where he even destroys the murderers and burns their cities because they didn't listen to the king. So there's the rejection of the imitation, but there's, that doesn't stop the party. And this was a one-of-a-kind party because the king was determined, determined to honor his son. And so what he's going to do is he's going to fill the feast. There will be the crowd that is to be there to honor his son, and rightfully so. And so what does he do? He goes out and gives a free offer for all to come in to the feast. And as the offer goes out, you probably start asking maybe the questions that I did. Aren't, aren't they kind of going to the wrong people? It's said that there are people who are both good and bad. So 
God, obviously you're picking the wrong people to come to the wedding feast. You got to have the right people. And doesn't this dishonor you? I mean, you're, you're trying to do this for your son, but doesn't this dishonor your son? Listen to what 1 Corinthians 1, 27 through 29. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring nothing to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Do we really believe that? Because there's definitely days, if I'm honest, where I think, God, you did a good thing choosing me. I'm a nice person. I really am. I mean, we're making baskets right now for our COVID people. I went and mowed people's yards who had COVID. I do nice things for my neighbors. Even ones who allow their dogs to defecate in my yard. I still like them and do things for them. That's the problem, isn't it? When we begin to think that God owes us for what we've done. So he takes that which is what we would say are dishonorable and he gives them the places of honor. Why? Because of his son. Now I also want you to understand that this is one of a kind of a party because the people that are brought here are people who will probably be breaking protocol. If you bring in people who are refined, who understand what it means to be politically correct, and you start to go out into the places, I mean, I, even this past week at a, at a fast food place, um, one of the people responded to us, and they were just like, now, now come on, honey, just come on over here and pick this up. And I was just like, well, that's politically incorrect. How, how in the world are they able to still say this? unrefined, politically incorrect. And you know what happens when those kind of people come? You actually have a good party. Because the refined only do things within what they're allowed to do. The unrefined rejoice. One of the commentators made this statement. There was a merry clatter at the party. Aren't you want, don't you want to get to that place without having to drink alcohol to where you become anti-Presbyterian? You get a little loose. Think about that. To go out and party. No reservations. Because why? Because you were brought into the feast of the king's son. And what wonder and honor and graciousness are you for even being there? as compared to those who were unworthy, who wouldn't even show up at the request of the king. So there's this great party that's going on, but there are still rules, which means there's a, there is still proper wedding attire required. And so again, those of us who've received wedding things, you always look for what's the attire is it black tie? Is it just business casual? What is it? What are we allowed to do? What do we have to wear so that we're not coming in in our jorts and t-shirts? <laughs> See, there is a, an understanding that you had to have the wedding garments. You had to have the proper attire. And not only was the proper attire required, but listen, it was provided by the king. So it wasn't like the person that was there without the attire was just like, well, I didn't get the memo or I didn't have time to go out and change. Everything was provided. The wedding garments were there. So why, why did he come and didn't put on the garment? Is it simply a rejection? 
Did he kind of look at the king and just said, I don't need to wear the wedding garment? You know what we call those people? Hypocrites. Scoffers. Remember, there's, there's not just two people in the scripture that it talks about. There's three people. There's the wise person, the one who knows the truth and applies it and lives by it. Then there's the fool. And the fool, he's not aware of what's required. But then there's the scoffer, the one who knows the truth and decides not to. That's who Jesus is talking about here. He's saying there is one who was invited to the wedding, who was provided a garment to come by the king himself, and yet does not put it on. And so he becomes hypocritical. And when the king comes in and he says to him very clearly, friend. Now that is a, a nuanced statement. And it's a very charged statement. And he's saying, I have invited you. I have invited you freely to come into my son's feast. I have come into my presence. I provided you with everything. And I come here and I look. And so, friend, if you are someone who loves me, someone who cares for me, someone who wants to honor me, why did you not put on the garment? And it says he was speechless. See, that's the way it is for all of us. We all know when um, I told you the, the, the time where, again, I think five to 10 miles over the speed limit's not really speeding. It's only those people who are 15 and above who fly by me. And we were, um, again, in traffic the other day, and uh, there's a guy who cut around some cars, and there was a sheriff coming out um, of one of the side streets and took off with his lights on. I'm like, yes! Oh, they deserve that. My wife said, oh, remember what you preached. And I was like, oh, okay. But I knew that if I had gotten pulled over and he said, why were you driving one mile over the speed limit? I'm speechless. Because I know what I have done is wrong. And so did this man. He knew what he had done was wrong to the king. Listen to what scripture says from Psalm 76, verses 8 through 9. From the heaven, you, God, uttered judgment, and the earth feared and listened and was still. When God comes and judge, we're going to be quiet. And when God arose to establish judgment to save all the humble of the earth. See, it's all about God. See, it's, it's his righteousness that's given. There's a thing that happens each year, and it's down or up for us in Georgia at a little place called Augusta. And during the Masters, there's an opportunity for you to win the green jacket. And so the winner of that tournament gets the green jacket and he is therefore then allowed to wear this jacket. But listen, as I was doing the study, it's not allowed to leave the grounds. You only wear it at Augustus, except the champion may take it with him for one year and bring it back. And then he does something that he only, that he only allowed to do is he gets to present the champion's dinner. And he gets to pick everything, the hors d'oeuvres. He gets to pick the main course and he gets to pick the dessert. And it could be everything from hamburgers and French fries, from Tiger Woods to this next time he had peach cobbler and ice cream for one of the winners. But who are the only ones who can get into that dinner? Only the champions and only with the green jacket. Now here's the thing. Even if someone had taken the green jacket and given it to me, would I be allowed to go into that dinner? No, I would not. But here's the difference between Augusta and Jesus Christ. The difference between infusion and imputation. See, infusion means that I was given the opportunity to take the righteousness of Christ. Imputation means Christ's righteousness is given to me. So that when God sees me, he doesn't see Jeff, he sees Jesus and his perfection. That's why I'm allowed to go in to the wedding feast. 
because it's at the invitation of the Son who allows me to come. And when he does that, what he does is he takes our acts, our things that we think that we're doing that are so good and so righteous in and of ourselves, and he takes them, and God tells us in Isaiah that they were as filthy rags, but with but, but with Jesus' blood, he makes them, listen, into the wedding garment of the bride. And I want you to understand that it, those of you who don't know Jesus Christ, or those of you who have been a scoffer, who've been sitting in these seats, or have been in church for years and years and years, and you kind of look and say, I'm doing okay on my own. No, you're not. See, it's all or nothing. And a lot of times we, we try to do this. I was told a story of someone um, who was driving down the road and he saw on the, on the side of a barn um, these arrows that were stuck into the targets and they were hit in the center every time. And he was just like, this is amazing. And he stopped and um, he was asking the person. So what happened is the person would take the arrow and he would shoot the arrow into the barn and then he would go and paint the target around the arrow. <laughs> and sometimes that's what we do. God, I'm okay, and I'm good enough. Bless what I'm doing. And God comes and says there's only one person who's ever perfectly hit the target every time, and he's my son, Jesus Christ. And he comes and he offers to you that invitation. He says, come. Come, you who are broken. Come, you who are broken homeless, worthless, in prison, self-righteous. Come to Jesus Christ who gives to you everything. And now come to the feast of my son to give him all honor that he is rightfully due. So I ask the question of us, have we rejected the invitation? Are we indifferent? Are we making excuses? Or maybe we're even in opposition. But for those who've been given the opportunity and the invitation and you say, I've given my life to Christ as he's come and he's opened my eyes to see and my heart to understand, then are we giving him glory and honor that he is rightfully due? Or have we decided to take off the wedding garment and try it on our own. But this is the cool thing. Is it's never too late. And Jesus comes even now to all of us sitting here. And he says, my righteousness I give to you freely. Take. And then come and taste of the fatted calf at the wedding feast of the lamb that was slain. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, it's your invitation. And Lord, it doesn't matter that I preach. It doesn't matter that we clean up really well. Lord, it doesn't matter that we have read through the Bible 20 times in our lifetime. It doesn't matter that we've given and fed homeless during the Thanksgiving or Christmas holiday. Lord, we do all of that in response to your righteousness, not to earn it. And so, Father, I pray that we are not indifferent. I pray that we don't make excuses or in opposition to you. And, Lord, I pray that we're not the people who do not pick up the wedding garment to wear it to the feast. But Father, may we be found in Christ and him alone so that someday we might hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest and come to the wedding feast of the Lamb. Come and enjoy the party of eternity in all of the universe. 
as we come and honor the King's Son. Father, may our names be found in the book of life. And Lord, may we take it and be those servants to take the invitation and hand deliver it to the people that are around us to invite them to the wedding feast to come along with us. So Father, may we be faithful as you're faithful. May we love as you love. For we pray all of this in the powerful, in the power of the Holy Spirit, but Lord, more specifically, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.